literature and the right to death. And in my usual manner, I've forgotten the precise date of this um, publication. I have a terrible memory for dates. And I could look this up last night, and I won't forget it today. So, 19, early 50s. And it, yes, now that just, you know, it's coming into my mind that in fact this was published at the same time as Sartre was writing about the notion of engagement. Um, and, and you will see at one point that um, Blanchot would, refers almost directly to Sartre. So it, it, there's a kind, of, uh, a kind of dialogue going on here, a kind of uh, counter play going on here, because he is he's countering Sartre um, and suggesting that this notion of engagement is, uh, sort of betrays the peculiar character of literary writing. If you, if you take a look at Sartre's book, it's really, it's a very, very interesting um, uh, uh, debate going on here. Sartre wants to, um, <clears throat> wants to propose a notion of literary commitment whereby the literary work serves a socio-political cause. And, and, and in order to do this, he has to say that poetry doesn't count as literature. Because poetry works with language in a way that is... Um, it's a, it's a more passive relation to language. language. Language is produced in a kind of opacity in the poetic texts, um, and that uh, um, undoes the, um, the, 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 the representation that is required for a committed literature. Blanchot, in this text, almost generalizes that, that poetic condition in, in a language, um, and he tends to talk more about the novel than he does about poetry, although there is some reference to poetry here. But he's generalizing that, um, that opacity, that passivity of language when he starts to talk about the literary act. But he does this um, through, through a movement which begins with a very playful, um, uh, very ironic, uh, um, very humorous engagement of the dialectic. And he compares literary, well, he starts out by talking about the literary act and the, the various uh, dilemmas that the author faces, um, constantly finding himself or herself disappropriated in relation to this thing which enters uh, the, uh, the public space. And I will, um, I'm just going to skip over that. It's, it, we don't have the time to really um, consider these pages, which are very slippery, <clears throat> Sometimes it's, you know, you're not quite sure what he's up to, but um, I, I would just like to suggest that, that it is a, it's a very playful, very, um, uh, yeah, very, very, very sly uh, playing with, with dialectic. And this goes quite far. Um, the, the, this essay, by the way, was originally in two parts. And um, the first part is this, is, is this engagement with dialectic. And then the second part is where he starts talking about the, the, the literary work and language in this, in this way I was describing a few moments ago, where he engages this passivity of language. So it's, uh, and, and in fact the tone seems to change, and, and I suppose what I want to do really is just look at the second half of the, uh, this essay, rather than the first, which is about dialectic. But he, he does, in the course of this uh, discussion, make a very interesting and important comparison between the work of the writer and the work of someone who is producing something in the world. And he makes the comparison between, he says, for example, we, um, why would a literary work not be the same as some piece of equipment, to speak as we were last week in, in relation to Heidegger? Why would a literary work not be uh, something produced as something that, that helps us change the world and helps us in some way, modify our existence in order to move toward a more uh, complete world and, and to complete the work of making it um, fully available to us. Um, it says, you know, when we make a stove, uh, we give ourselves uh, warmth, we give ourselves uh, the possibility of cooking, uh, we, we modify our existence and therefore enable other activities within the world and hence move toward the production of the world itself as, 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 a, as, a, as a site that we inhabit in a, in a fully meaningful manner. What about the literary work? Is that not also um, a production in the same sense? 
um, when we when we produce a, a literary work, we, we take language as we found it. We take materials, just as with the stove, we take its raw materials. We take literary language. I mean, we take la the state of language as we find it, um, the state of uh, our culture as we find it, and then by producing a literary work, we modify that. We we make a transformation in relation to our historical circumstances, presumably in view of uh, some form of, of progression, some sort of moving forward. Um, but he says there is something peculiar about the, uh, the literary act, and that is that when we intervene in this world, we in fact skip over all of the usual mediations involved in changing that world and in, in, in doing some kind of a work. In fact, the literary writer has, um, has, has a very peculiar kind of freedom. The literary writer can be, as, and, and his Saad will be his, his, his favorite example, a literary writer can be in a prison and write, uh, evoke a freedom, and in fact write out of a freedom, which allows for a complete transformation of the world. But of course this is an utterly abstract transformation. The, the writer is able to engage the totality of being, uh, from this peculiar position of freedom in relation to language, and yet, in a certain sense, nothing changes. Right? It, um, nothing changes and everything changes. Uh, we know about the, he says, we know about the extraordinary impact that writers have, and yet, what do they do? Uh, what, what, exa what kind of work is this? And his, um, he suggests that the writer is negating the world in its totality, so exercising in that way a negation, not unlike the negation exercised in, um, in work, in labor. Uh, the writer uh, negates the totality, but immediately moves into um, a space that is, so to speak, nowhere. Um, an imaginary space. That is, that is precisely the space of the whole, rather than um, you know, a, a finite place within the world. The, the writer is engaging the world itself in its totality, not anything in the world. I'm looking at, uh, I'm, at I'm at about 3.16 now in the text. The writer's influence at the top of the page is linked to his privilege of being master of everything, but he's only master of everything. He possesses only the infinite. He lacks the finite. Limit escapes him. Now one cannot act in the infinite, one cannot accomplish anything in the unlimited, so that if a writer acts in a quite, in quite a real way as he produces this real thing which is called a book, he is also discrediting all action by this action, because he is substituting for the world of determined things and defined work a world in which everything is instantly given and there is nothing left to do but read it and enjoy it. In general, the writer seems to be subjected to a state of inactivity because he is a, the master of the imaginary, and those who follow him into the realm of the imaginary lose sight of the problems of their true lives. But the danger he rep represents is much more serious. So it's not imaginary in a casual, sort of fanciful sense that, that he's describing here. There's, there's a, another dimension of imaginary. The truth is that he ruins action not because he deals with what is unreal, but because he makes all of reality available to us. Unreality begins with the whole. The realm of the imaginary is not a strange reason, such region situated beyond the world. It is the world itself. But the world is entire manifold, the world as a whole. That is why it is not in the world, because it is the world, grasped and realized in its entirety by the global negation of all the individual realities contained in them, by their disqualification, their absence, by the realization of that absence itself, which is how literary creation begins. For when literary creation goes back over each thing and each being, it cherishes the illusion that it is creating them, because now it is seeing and naming them from the starting point of everything from the starting point of the absence of everything, that is, from nothing. So the writer grasps uh, being in his, to in his totality and then writes from that position of negation or that transcendence, that distance, uh, to create a new world. And that, that world um, is indeed, a, you know, a, 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 represents an absolute transformation, but it's, it, it is indeed proceeding from an absolute of some sort, some, some kind of, of a, um, infinite separation. So, the way Blanchot will proceed here is to say that this negation that the writer effects is precisely what Hegel was describing as the, um, the stirring that occurs at the beginning of the dialectic, or stirring or the trembling or the shaking. There has to be a negation of all of being in order for this movement of spirit to unfold. And it unfolds in and through language. So, 
Blanchot makes this very, uh, very sly uh, connection between the origins of the dialectic itself and this literary act. He suggests that the same nothingness is at work, the same negative movement is at work. And thus, he inscribes right at the origin of the dialectic, in, or you know, in, 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 in the negativity which makes it possible, this imaginary dimension. So it's almost the, he, he, he attaches to that work of negation in language, which is proper to language itself, he says. Um, he attaches to that this, this, this other excessive, transcending movement, this imaginary movement. And so when he then gets into the discussion of the terror and Saad, he has um, he's produced a rather perverse idea of re revolution. He, you know, the, the, the revolutionary writer par excellence is Saad, sitting locked up in his prison cell, writing outrageous pornography um, as an act of absolute freedom. And so something has gone terribly wrong, in a certain sense, in this analysis of the, of, of the, the, the writer's exercise of freedom. But what, I think what he's done is he's inscribed what he's calling the imaginary, this is his notion of the imaginary, into the movement of negation. So the writer is touching upon the negative act, um, of negation, which is also what is required for the movement of the dialectic, um, but has, is turning that negation in a certain sense, or opening it into what he calls an imaginary space. Um, this, is, this, dis this discussion of the, uh, the link to the, the dialectic appears at 317, at the bottom of the page, and you can hear him um, reading Hegel, Hegel's uh, phenomenology. As we know, a writer's main temptations are called stoicism, skepticism, and the unhappy consciousness. These are all ways of thinking that a writer adopts for reasons he believes he has thought out carefully, but which only literature has thought out in him. A stoic, he is a man of the universe, which itself exists only on paper, and a prisoner or a poor man who endures his condition stoically because he can write, because the one minute of freedom in which he writes is enough to make him powerful. And Free <laughs> to give him not his own freedom, which he derives, but universal freedom. Then he goes on to nihilism, and then he, and he talks about then in the next page the unhappy consciousness. He says that the writer is in the position of the unhappy consciousness, which Hegel had diagnosed in the phenomenology. And, you know, I invite you to read those pages on the phenomenology, and then the, region, the pages on the terror in the phenomenology. We're talking about the French, uh, the French Revolution. Um, Again, this is, uh, he suggests um, the, the writer, in this drive to negate, has a very hard time resisting bringing that negation into reality. There is a curious uh, suggestion here, I think, that he is in a certain sense, he might almost be diagnosing his own revolutionary impetus in, in, the, in the 30s. And he could perhaps be diagnosing something that happened to Heidegger. Um, because he suggests that, the, that, that the, the writer cannot resist realizing this absolute negation. And so in that respect, the writer is like the revolutionary, like Robespierre or Saint-Just, who are exercise, who are, who are acting in the name of an absolute freedom and negating every finite um, instance in relation to that absoluteness of freedom, affirming freedom absolutely and suggesting that anything that compromises that freedom, any, um, any slight resistance to that absolute negation um, has to be eliminated. Hence, anyone who is the least suspect of resisting the revolution will have to be um, killed. Um, so the guillotine is cutting off heads, as Hegel says, like um, cabbages, with utter indifference, because the finite doesn't matter. The, the, the truth of this moment lies in absolute freedom, in, in the freedom of uh, this, this people, and the individual, um, insofar as they harbor any kind of resistance, any, 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 any negativity, any finite um, obstacle to this absolute realization of freedom has to be eliminated. So the um, Blanchot recognizes in, in the terror a temptation for the writer. And again, I, I can't help but think he, he must have been in this place himself uh, to a certain degree. And, um, and we might also see something like that having afflicted Heidegger. Which is to say that there has, they have become 
it, they're, they're falling into the grips of a passion which Blanchot is saying has an imaginary dimension to it. Um, this, this, this excessive freedom is, is abstract in relation to the, um, to the finite and to the, you know, the physical world. I, I urge you again just to look, at, look through these pages. They're absolutely marvelous. They have produced some um, very uh, remarkable readings including um, Derrida's in the, near the end of his life. He, he started focusing on the question of um, the death penalty. And he produced a very bizarre reading of this text, um, suggesting that, that Blanchot was, if not in favor of the death penalty, at least failing to critique the death penalty. Now, how you could draw that reading from these pages is, is absolutely beyond me. It's, it's a really... Yeah, um, odd term in Derrida's work, but nevertheless, it, it, you know, this was a very provocative passage, and, and certainly Derrida was was caught by it in a certain sense, caught up in it in some way. Um, so Blanchot is, as I say, there is a there, there's some very interesting things being said about rev the revolution, about the abstract character of revolution, at least as it's realized in the terror and in a moment of the dialectic, as Hegel describes it, and so I, I really do, again, uh, urge you to take a look at this. It's, it is um, it is um, quite fascinating, and the stuff on Saad is just, just delightful. Um, but he goes on then to talk about the relation between, or to talk about the negative in language, which um, Hegel takes over for the movement of the dialectic itself. Plasho is reading Hegel through Kojev in this, and uh, he is engaging thereby with you know, the, really the master discourse of the moment. Right? Kojev's lectures on Hegel uh, were absolutely uh, defining for, for the intellectual uh, milieu in which uh, Blanchot was functioning, and everybody, everybody was in some way um, reacting to that. <clears throat> so he's reading Hegel with and to some extent against Kojev. As he, as he develops this notion of, of negativity. At the bottom of three, 321 is the, um, I think, as I remember correctly, this is where the two portions of this text are yoked together. Literature contemplates itself in revolution, writes, it finds its justification in revolution, and if it has been called the reign of terror, this is because its ideal is indeed that moment in history, that moment when quote, life endures death and maintains itself in it in order to gain from death the possibility of speaking and the truth of speech. This is um, the phrase that I was referring to yesterday, and it comes in French, la vie qui porte la mort et se maintient en elle. La vie qui porte la mort, life that bears death or brings death, um, they're picking up bears with endures here, the translator is, um, but porter means carry, right? Mm -hmm. But also porter in the sense of to bring. So, la vie qui porte la mort, that carries death in it. It's a life that is, in some sense, um, bears death and brings death. Et se maintient en elle. This life of the spirit maintains itself in death. La vie qui porte la mort et se maintient en elle. Now, what Blanchot will do in this essay is turn that phrase in a, in a kind of perverse way. La vie qui porte la mort, it's carrying death. Life carries death in it. But, as Blanchot will, will start to work at this, it's almost though it carries some uncanny other in it. Right? Porte la mort, il se maintient en elle. It, it, it maintains itself in it. it. It lives by this death, by this negating, by the work of the negative. But at the same time, there is in this death an, an, an uncanny otherness. So the, it, that it that it bear that their life thereby bears with it, and which is other than it. We, we will see him develop this as he as he goes forward. And then suddenly he says, "This is the question that seeks to pose itself in literature. The question that is its essence. This is the turn in the essay into the new essay. It's, it's very, it's rather abrupt uh, 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 if you if you read through it. He goes on. Literature is bound to language." Language is reassuring and disquieting at the same time. When we speak, we gain control over things with satisfying ease. I say, this woman, and she's immediately available to me. 
I push her away, I bring her close, she's everything I want her to be. She becomes the place in which the most surprising sorts of transformations occur and actions unfold. Speech is life's ease and security. He's suggesting that when we, when we speak of something, we can do so only in as much as that thing has been negated in its finite particularity. The, the, this woman has now become an abstraction in language. And once that abstraction has occurred, once that, um, he will describe this with Hegel, once that murder has occurred, this, um, this, this abstracting allows us to, to do anything at that point. Right? And so that, that there's a complete freedom in relation to the, the thing. Or at least the freedom insofar as language, uh, as far as language itself reaches. He is, I presume this is following Saad a little bit, um, this reference to uh, Setfan. I'm not exactly sure why he has, uh, why he has chosen a woman in this instance. Um, it, it may be somewhat problematic, but in other texts, Blanchot is writing about women in, in, in a way that suggests a very different understanding of the feminine. So I, I have a suspicion that the, that the reference to Saad has induced this, um, you know, this, this particular reference and the possibility of this um, absolute freedom. I mean, that's the way Saad is, is, is treating women and the mother in, in his text. Absolute negation. He's also remembering um, Mallarmé, um, and a very famous reflection on language where he says, uh, je, dis, je dis cette fleur, this flower, and, and Mallarmé goes on, and I say in this, the absence from all bouquets. Um, I can't remember all of the lines. He talks about the smell. I, I, I have the smell. I have the the shape, I have the presence, um, and this is absent from all bouquets. So that, that I can, you know, that I evoke the flower poetically, and I have evoked an abstraction, um, a, a beautiful abstraction, but you know, uh, it is absent from any bouquet, right? any real bouquet. So, <coughs> three twenty-two, at the bottom of the page. Considered in this light, speaking is a curious right, literature and the right to death. Considered in this light, speaking is a curious right. In a text dating from before the phenomenology, Hegel, here the friend and kindred spirit of Hölderlin, and he's picking up the fact that Hölderlin and Hegel were living together at a certain point in their youth, and they were writing texts together. There is a text called The Most Ancient Program, uh, Le Plus Ancien Program in French, of, uh, of German idealism, I think it is, in class of title, and they don't know who wrote it. Um, it could have been Hegel, Schelling, or Hölderlin, you know, the young men working together. The poet, you know, Hegel and then Schelling, two speculative idealists. And, but looking closely, they think it, it's probably the first draft is in Hölderlin's hand. So, um, that he would have written this, this, one of these originary texts for speculative idealism is just you know, an absolutely astounding fact. So, again, Blanchot uh, is bringing into proximity these authors, but then he will move them apart in another way. In a text dating from before the phenomenology, Hegel, here the friend and kindred spirit of Hölderlin, writes, Adam's first act, which made him master of the animals, was to give them names, that is, he annihilated them in their existence, as existing creatures. Hegel means from that moment on, the cat ceased to be uni a uniquely real cat and became an idea as well. The meaning of speech, then, requires that before any word is spoken, there must be a sort of immense hecatomy, a preliminary flood plunging all of creation into a total sea. God had created living things, but man had to annihilate them. Not until then did they take on meaning for him, and he in turn created them out of the death into which they had disappeared. We're at page 323. Um, only instead of beings, être, and as we say existence, existant, there remained only being. And man was condemned not to be able to approach anything or experience anything except through the meaning he had to create. He saw that he was enclosed in daylight, in language, and he knew this day could not end because the day, it's, the end itself was light, since it was from the end of beings that their meaning, which is being, had come. Now he goes on a bit more about this, um, this, this killing that goes on in language, this murdering of the thing by which it's brought into the abstraction of ideality and, uh, and meaning. Um, Page 323 and 324, um, he says, I, 
in, a, in effect, I negate the world, I negate the thing, I kill that thing, if we follow the image of Hegel. Um, but at the same time, he says, I'm killing myself, because I who speak has to give, I have to give myself over to abstraction. So this is, uh, again, already the notion of a death, a death of the author. As soon as the author engages language in this act of, of writing, the author is losing himself or herself in their finite um, particularity or their material existence. So I, I'll just read um, a little bit more, 324. Clearly in me the power to speak is also linked to my absence from being. I say my name and it is as though I were chanting my own dirge. I separate myself from myself. So this is, this is a dying into language. Okay? Um, and I, yesterday I was talking about the death of the infants. I said this is a double death. The, the child, there is a passing into language, which is the condition of the use of language, which is what he's describing here. A dying into negation. A dying into this capacity to employ the, the, the negative, the, the abstracting language. But as he will go on and say, there's something that's, that's lost here. Um, but for the moment, he's just describing that first dying. That the dying that is the movement of, that is involved in the movement of dialectic itself. I am no longer either my presence or my reality, but an, an objective and personal presence, the presence of my name, which goes beyond me, and whose stone-like immobility performs exactly the same function for me as a tombstone weighing on the void. When I speak, I deny the existence of what I am saying, but I also deny the existence of the person who is saying it. it if my speech reveals being in its non-existence, it also affirms that this revelation is made on the basis of the non-existence of the person making it out of his power to remove himself from himself, to be other than his being. This is why, if true language is to begin, the life that will carry this language must have experienced its nothing, must have, and this is a famous text, famous sentence from Hegel, must have trembled in the depths, and everything in it that was fixed and stable must have been shaken. This is a, uh, a, shutru, a, 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 a deep um, breaking away of the thing from its material being, or breaking of the thing in its material being and the advent of, of the negative. It comes up over and over. Heidegger uses this image of a, tre of a trembling, and Lascio also picks it up. Language can begin only with the void, no fullness, no certainty can ever speak, nothing essential is lacking in anyone who expresses himself. Negation is tied to language. Let me just repeat a really beautiful sentence. When I first begin, I do not speak in order to say something. Rather, a nothing demands to speak. Nothing speaks. Nothing finds its being in speech, and the being of speech is nothing. This formulation explains why literature's ideal has been the following, to say nothing. He's talking about Malame. Um, I'll come to him To say nothing, to speak in order to say nothing. That is not the musing of a high-class kind of nihilism. Language perceives that its meaning derives not from what exists, but from its own retreat before existence, and it is tempted to proceed no further than this retreat to try to attain negation in itself and to make everything of nothing. So, there is this temptation then in language, in literature, to explore that negation that, by which uh, language proceeds. In other words, to give itself over to that negation in some extreme and rarefied form, and that is... He's, he's, he's describing Malame, the project of Malame at this moment, um, to write a book that is the absence of the book in, 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 in a certain sense. Yes, you have a question. Um, so, this, uh, he's, he's talking all about sort of writing and naming, which is um, in, in sort of this, the. Um, he's not really addressing the. the, uh, the Temporal aspect, which is that when you write something, it's, it's then it exists in time and then it's read and repeated. Um, and I wonder how we're meant to sort of take that aspect of um, something of, of of the something being named and continue and continue and owning that name, having that name into the future, and that name being. No, at this point, I mean that's, that's a, a, the book being. Yeah, read that's that's a good question. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. He is, um, and in some sense, he's he has treated that in the preceding part of the text when he talks about the writer's dilemmas. They produce something, they think, ah, oh, this is it. This is this is me. Uh, um, you know, I've, I've expressed what I what I wanted to say. This it's it's perfect. It's, and then suddenly, the readers come along, 
and disappropriate the writer of that thing which they thought had, had achieved some form of perfection, which was their own existence, perfectly uh, uh, realized in the thing. And suddenly it's being, it's, it's being sold in the marketplace. And uh, critics are saying, look at the genius here. And, and their writer says, oh my god, I hadn't quite realized it, but they must be right. Yes, I am a genius. Or that, um, you know, and on and on, there's, there's a kind of disappropriation that occurs with temporality. In this part of the text, I think Blanchot is, is writing primarily about uh, what, it is, what it is to engage language in writing. And so it is an experience of, of dying. And it's, it's, it's very much the author's experience. Reading, um, reading would, would entail, presumably, a similar kind of dying, right? to, 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 to give oneself over to this negation. But as he goes on, I, I want to um, um, sort of urge you to hold off uh, thinking about that, because as he goes on, he's going to start talking about the presence of language in another way. And that, that too, complicates this issue of what it would mean to read it. But it is a time, to some extent, a time outside time, in the, in the sense of you know, it is, it is the time of spirit, uh, which is, uh, you know, the, the speed of spirit as it's, as it's negating the world. Okay, so I, I, would, love to, I, I would love to go. I mean, this, the sentences, one th I didn't get a chance to say to you yesterday something that I think is just absolutely essential, which is that, that Blanchot is using the French language in just the most staggeringly beautiful way. I mean, his, his, uh, the poise with which he writes is, is just astounding. This writing is still very much of the 40s and 50s. It has a certain um, complicated eloquence and elegance to it. That is, it's very Gallic. It's you know, it's 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 high. It's high Gallic, if I could put it that way. You know, it's this is this is a writer's writing, and um, it's, it's, it, it itself is very beautifully poised. It's full of humor, um, but at the same time, you know, you recognize, you can almost recognize the Alexandrin in this writing. I mean, this is this is high French in, in a sense. But the text we read yesterday, the madness of the day. Um, you know, it has a, it is a simple elocution, and, and the language is chosen with the most incredible poise. I mean, it's just, um, and it has a trait, if you had it, if you have had a chance to read this literature and write the death at all, or um, if you will come to it, look at the passage where he talks about Kafka writing the sentence, he was looking out the window. And he gets into this really marvelous play where he says, you know, Kafka says, that's it, there it is, I've written the perfect sentence. This, this is me. I don't need to go any farther. I am an author. I have realized, um, you know, the, the act of writing. He was looking out the window. Absolutely flat, right? Nothing in that sense to so, you know, it. But, of course, if you remember the madness of the day and what I, what I described to you about the, that primal scene with the death of a child, looking out the window is just the moment before that, you know, the, the smash there, or the break, or, the, or the, 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 this passage that he's trying to think. So it's extremely playful, but he's also, I think he's pointing to something, literary language, um, as he realizes it in the madness of the day. Remember that phrase, the, 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 the one the protagonist says, um, I disappeared into those, to the doctors, the hunter was the hunter, and he says, the words spoke alone. And, and he's talking about a, a curious presence of literary language, and he captures that, I think, with that phrase of Kafka. It is absolutely flat, and then at the same time, absolutely resonant in some way. And, and this text is turning around that peculiar character of language. As, as, we, as we go forward, you'll see him develop this a bit more. And what I wanted to be able to tell you, in a way, is the madness of the day is full of that kind of language. It's, it's a strangely literary language in the way that um, Blanchot was describing in this text. And, I, you know, you'll often find in Blanchot these sentences which seem to, have, are, seem to be absolutely flat and absolutely meaningful at the same time. Um, there's this extraordinary ambiguity to them. And it's an ambiguity of kind of perfect poise. You know, that's simplest possible writing um, poised with, in, in, this, in this ambiguous relation between an absolute of some kind and another absolute of some kind, and just translated in a kind of strange flatness. So would you agree that the last sentence of the Bible of page 24 is very important? Would I agree that I'm sorry that it's a very, very important sentence the way he's clearly dissociating himself from the nihilism. Yes. And he's in, you know talking about the negative as a kind of root to the ultimate affirmation. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You, you know, you might, he is. I mean, he's occupying a very difficult position here. You know, Sartre is is the dominant voice uh, at this point, and you know, after the after the war, 1948. 
you're saying that literature is not concerned with political action is, a, um, you know, at the level that Sartre had described as a rather almost dangerous step to take. I mean, he still, it, 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 one might take this as a kind of high-class nihilism in the sense of the surrealists, uh, or those whose writing seems to be a frivolous, um, infantile play in relation to the serious business that has to go on, you know, in this, in this moment of regaining some, 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 some world, as a matter of fact. Um, so it looks like it could be a kind of uh, indulgence in that sense, a nihilism in indulgence. But what, what Blanchot is, I think, trying to do is, well, he's moving toward another kind of affirmation already in this text. And that's, you know, I'm, I'm, I haven't quite broached that, 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 that next step, but he's about to make it. Um, but it is, um, he's not in, you know, he's not celebrating this negative movement simply. Um, first of all, he's not celebrating because he's already said this, this negative that literature works with and explores is, has an imaginary component. I and mean, he just leaves that, but as we go forward, this word imaginary will take on more, more force. And so there is, um, this is the, the, the nihilation that language um, indulges in is not simply a a ruining negative, so to speak, yeah. you know, in the sense of those we might attach to some things. Okay, so, we, you know, everyday language is perfectly comfortable with the negations that go on in language. Uh, we say cat, and we don't worry about the fact that the word cat has nothing to do with a cat. Um, a cat is a cat, and that's that, you know. And I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm, re I'm literally reading a cat in a hat at home. <laughs> <That's nice. laughs> so, the, um, you didn't bring that to class. I didn't bring it to class, though, but, um, but then, you know, the, you know, we try to be a bit more precise in our language, and we realize we have to say, well, to think of cat, we have to think of dog, and we have to start thinking, you know, uh, how this word cat relates to other words in order to capture the essence of the cat. To be more precise about a cat, we have to express catness. To that, get that, we have to have dogness. And, and, and suddenly, there's another kind of dialectic moving. Language is starting to work through a series of tropes, attempting to say this essence of the thing that... Common language says, well, we've got it, what's the problem? A cat's a cat. Um, but, well, no, the poet says, no, to, be, to, to say this thing, we're going to have to go farther and to really capture it, what it is. And the more we, we indulge in this process, the more the tropes multiply and, and we move into almost language in its totality to try to capture the essence of the thing, the more we realize that still something has been lost. Language has, has lost that thing um, by virtue of the negation which made language possible in the first place. There is some, something of the physical being of the cat has been, has been left behind. And this, this, uh, this, this lost thing haunts language. It can't forget what, what was left behind. It, can't, it, it is constantly, um, yeah, li literally haunted by this presence of what has been lost. So, he takes us then um, into the movement which begins on page 326 and 27. Language is now desperately trying to capture the essence, um, and it's, this seems to be an unlimited pursuit. Um, that's on page 326. And then there's this beautiful passage, at bottom 326. I just love the sentence. That even if literature stopped here, it would have a strange and embarrassing job to do. <laughs> a bizarre activity of trying to say this. Uh, uh, the, the French is embarrassant, but I think the translation is actually correct. It's, it's, it would have a very awkward <laughs> obligation. But it does not stop here. It recalls the first name, which would be the murder Hegel speaks of. The existence was called out of its existence by the word, and it became being. This Lazar veni for us, Lazar come forth summoned the dark, cadaverous reality from its primordial depths, and in exchange gave it only the life of the mind. Now, if you want to read this text carefully, you've got to start watching the tropological movements that, that Blanchot is describing. He says, we're trying to get the, the thing, right, in its essence, the living thing. And what is the example he gives us? Trying to call forth a dead body, right? <laughs> so suddenly, death and life are, 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 switching, are switching valences very fast. And, you know, again, I, I don't have time to do this with you, but if you follow this text as it's, as it's um, starting to substitute terms for one another, the, it becomes quite dizzying and, and quite, um, well, quite beautiful in that, in that dizzying. And this is the ambiguity that I was talking about before um, in, in literary writing. 
So this Laza come forth, summoned the dark, cadaverous reality from its primordial depths, and in exchange gave it only the life of the mind. This is the problem that he describes in his many meditations on Orpheus and Eurydice. Orpheus wants to go into hell to find Eurydice, but not to bring her back as the living Eurydice he had known and loved. He wants to go and find the dead Eurydice. He wants Eurydice in her otherness, in, her, in, in that dark, uh, in that death that she inhabits. And of course, Orpheus can't do it. He, 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 he can't resist the temptation to look back, and, um, and when he does so, he loses her. She slips back into the, into the depths. And this is part of what Blanchot is trying to evoke here. Language knows that its kingdom is, is day and not the intimacy of the revealed. It knows that in the, uh, uh, of the unrevealed, so language is here trying to get back before revelation, before the advent of light, uh, of the light of language, back into the, the, the depths, so to speak. It knows that in order for the day to begin, for the day to become that orient that Holonin glimpsed, and this is the lines that I was citing a lot last week and I mentioned again yesterday, I waited and saw it come, and what I saw in the holy be my word. That's that advent of light, that, that coming of the day by which the thing is given in its being. Heidegger thought so much about. It knows that in order for the day to begin, for the day to be that orient, that which Holonin glimpsed, not light that has become the repose of noon, but the terrible force that draws beings into the world and illuminates them, something must be left out. Negation cannot be created out of anything but the reality of what it is negating. Language derives its value and its pride from the fact that it is achievement of this, the achievement of this negation. But in the beginning, what was lost? The torment of language is what it lacks because of the necessity that it be the lack of precisely this. It cannot even name it. Because its naming proceeds from that negation. And then that sentence, whoever sees God dies. There it is again. He uses the sentence throughout his, his career. In speech, what dies is what gives life to speech. Speech is the life of that death. It is the life that endures death and maintains itself in it. What wonderful power. But something was there and is no longer there. Something has disappeared. How can I recover? How can I turn around and look at what exists before if all my power consists of making it into what exists after? So, it continues then, the language of literature, literature is a search for this moment which precedes literature. And literature thus is, is thus a constant sort of uh, a constant allegory, constantly pointing back to something that has been lost, and that it is prior to negation, in that sense, or is, is, um, is, is something of the negative which exceeds the negative, and which the negative cannot quite capture. So language then becomes, literary language becomes obsessed with something um, that, that, that haunts language as in, in a way that it is born with and in language, but never is quite subsumed in the meaning in language. La vie qui porte la mort et se maintient en rien. So, what happens then? Literature tries to find a way back. And he takes here, um, as his example, the work of Francis Pange, who tries to um, write a poetry about things. And the, uh, he's also talking about, um, uh, oh my God, uh, um, the poet, um, no, I'm sorry? Is it Godfrey Ben? No, 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 a French poet. Um, a French poet who tries to... Apollinaire. Apollinaire tries to render, render the physicality of, of language. And, and the, the effort is, well, if language denies the thing in order to, to become, uh, in order to bring us the meaning of the thing, and if, and if literary language is in some sense uh, caught within that order of meaning as in a kind of prison, and if the idea is to get back to what was lost through that negation, well then maybe we should go through language itself, and that language itself is a thing. So the poet's um, enterprise is then to, to bring forth the thingliness of language, right? Or the, um, and this is a curious twist on Heidegger, for those of you who were with me last week, to try to, to, try to capture the, the physicality of language, the materiality of language. And in that process, even to destroy the uh, signified which seems to attend language all the time, the meaning, right? To, to, to push this, this reification of language, or, or, or this, uh, reification is not a good word, but, uh, but this, this um, push this practice of bringing forward the thing to such a degree that, um, that, the, that the words start to shed their, their meaningful character. 
the signifier no longer clear, uh, bears a clear reference to, to a signifier. Right? So the, the poetic practice in, in these cases, Apollinaire and Ponge, is to, um, is, is to undo language's meaningful character and to bring, po bring forth its physical nature. Can you, so can you, name the, can you give an example of form, like which, which, which form of this? You know, he's describing, um, this is also what Sartre says about poetry. Poetry, uses, it, poetry has a passive relation to language, and it produces the word uh, almost without regard for the word's meaning in the real world of, of reference and uh, you know, in, the, in the political symbolic order. Poetry plays with language in such a way as to bring forth its resonance, its physicality, its, its presence as language, and to bring forth the strange presence that, 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 that the word has if we start to suspend our effort to grasp the meaning that inheres in it. So instead of, when we use language normally in such a way that language itself is effaced, and we move very quickly to the, to the meaning to capture what it conveys. In this case, the meaning is suspended in order to get to that curious physical presence of, of language. Um, I can't think of a particular poem, but um, you know, even Gertrude Stein does that, you know, a rose is a rose is a rose, and, and, and I mean, there are a lot of examples of it in poetry, and as I say, for Sartre, poetry is that, you know, he says it quite explicitly. I was just going to say, in terms of material references, I'm not as versed in a Polinaire, but with Ponge, his, the books um, like soap or the books uh, just about objects, they're just maybe, a, you know, a book would just be called Objects, and it's a, a great... What's the word? Francis Ponge, P-O-N-G-E, and it's, th that particular thing is taken up by, the, I think this movement in relation to specific poems in Ponge is taken up by Derrida uh, in Psyche, uh, Dimensions of the Other, um, this great book, and uh, particularly in the section where Derrida talks about fables, uh, and, and th this is where he's looking at one of the places where he's looking at Ponge very closely, and there's great references there to particular, you know, if you want to look at this work, if you're not familiar with Ponge's, yeah. This text also refers to Ponge in a lot of parts, so you can find the name there and, and a couple instances of that, that poetry. So, again, there are just some beautiful, <laughs> it's so playful, this text, you want to read all the sentences, especially if you know them already, to enjoy that, that humor that, that he's indulging in. But the movement that he now describes is this bringing forth of the physical presence of language. It's, it's precisely, he's indulging in the perversion that Sato uh, tried to push aside and saying that poetry is not really literature. And uh, as he says at the bottom of the page, a name ceases to be the ephemeral passing of non-existence and becomes a concrete ball, a solid mass of existence. Language abandoning the sense, the meaning which was all it wanted to be, tries to become senseless. Everything physical takes precedence. Rhythm, weight, mass, shape, and then the paper on which one writes, the trail of the ink, the book. Yes, happily language is a thing. It is a written thing. A bit, a bit of bark. <laughs> a sliver of rock. A fragment of clay in which the reality of the earth continues to exist. The word acts not as an ideal force, but as an obscure power, as an incantation that courses things, makes them really present outside of themselves. He's evoking now, he had referred to this quite a bit earlier in the text when he said that primitive man thinks that a word has a relation to the thing, and he treats the word as a thing with a with strange evocative power. And he's coming back to that. So poetry seems to be seeking that in the materiality of language. Um, and, and I have to read that. Look, look what happens there. He says, um, it is an element, a piece barely attached from the subterranean surroundings. It is no longer a name, but rather one moment in the universal anonymity, a bald statement, the stupor of a confrontation in the depths of obscurity. <laughs> Fantastic language. Um, and, he, and he says, when language starts to take this path into this physical, uh, uh, senseless being, he said, literature now dispenses with the writer. It is, it is no longer this inspiration at work, this negation asserting itself, this idea inscribed in the world as though it were the absolute perspective of the world in its totality. It is not beyond the world, but neither is it the world itself. It is the presence of things before the world exists. Their perseverance after the world has disappeared 
the stubbornness of what remains when everything vanishes, and the dumbfoundedness of what appears when nothing exists. That is why it cannot be confused with consciousness, which illuminates things and makes decisions. It is my consciousness without me. So, a kind of presence, a, a, a presence of reflection without self-reflection. There is, the, the, the thing is present, but without being appropriated as thing for itself. In, in this self-reflective movement, that is, the movement of spirit itself. My consciousness without me, the radiant passivity of mineral substances, the lucidity of the depths of torpor. So there is, remember Heidegger's, uh, for those of you who were with me last week, Heidegger's description of the way the work of art brings forth the earth as earth, and brings it forth in, a, in its luminescence, and its sonority, and its hardness, and so on. Blanchot is saying the same thing here. But what, what he, he insists that this is, uh, again, without um, anything that brings this forward as meaningful. So there is a, it's the presence of the other night as other night, or the presence of this otherness attending language as other. Um, so we have, you know, there, there is a, it's not simply obscurity, it's obscurity showing itself as obscurity. Right? Is this the second test? Is this the yes. Yeah. Yeah. My consciousness without me. I've died in this movement. Not the night, but the consciousness. <laughs> Perverse the night. It is not the night, but the consciousness of the night, which lies awake, waiting for a chance to surprise itself. And because of that, is constantly being dissipated. It can't be the night because it's, it's up all night, <laughs> waiting to become the night in its essence. But, you know, it, you know you knew, you've all had that experience in such a and, and it is not death either, because it manifests ex existence without being existence which remains below existence, like an inexorable affirmation without beginning or end. Death has the impossibility of dying. If dying is the moment of dialectic, this is a dying that is without that, that um, in a certain sense, this removal of self from self. And it, an inexorable affirmation. There is a presence there affirming itself, but it's affirming itself because it can't negate itself. It's a, it is a, it's just a, a mute presence. Yeah. I know that, um, I mean, it's a kind of obvious and pretty complex question for me, is relationship to the night or is like, this understanding of the night. And is it, it, at some points it seems sort of like, you know, it, the, the, not just the muse, but the, the, where everything bodies forth from. But at other points, it's like the, the haunting voices or something. You know, is, is, or the unconscious, or, you know, whatever, you know, the, the source of inspiration elsewhere in the uh, infinite conversation. I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of, like, how does he, how does he understand the night? I mean, it's uh, the, the writer's relation, let's say, to the night. Is it? The other night is... is a space, you can say, a space of literature, a space where there is no longer, see, where, where he says, um, to speak is not to see. Because in the metaphysical tradition, when we think of the, um, the creation of meaning and the grasping of meaning, if we think of the comprehending, that is, the movement of the concept, the begriff itself, that comprehension proceeds by light. And we saw that in Heidegger last week. Um, but it is, you know, from, from Plato forward, the manifestness of a thing as a thing is a function of a kind of illumination. And there has to be a lighting of beings in order for them to appear as beings. There has to be this clearing, this manifestation. Um, and um, Blanchot is certainly very engaged with Heidegger at this point. In this text. But he's, he's doing it essentially in relation to Hegel. And he's saying this, this murder of the thing is like, a, you know, is like... A, the, the, the Orient that Hölderlin saw, it's the flashing light um, by which day is revealed and, and day is the order of meaning in its entirety. Right? So the, the, the light brings us a relation to, um, to things and that relation is one of, of, a, of a murderous negation, but it's like, it's like, a, it's like a flashing light. So um, that takes, uh, takes us over from Plato and you know, the, the, the allegory of the cave and the idea of the good, which is a, a kind of illumination. Um, Blanchot says, no, when we use language um, in, as language, and he's trying to 
explore that now here. Oh, when, we use, when we use language, we have access to a dimension of language which escapes from that light. Even though language bears that light in it to some extent, there's never, you know, negation is always there um, as possible in, in and through language. But there's this other depth you know, that, that is involved when we engage with language. And that is, and so he says, he's interested in the literary enterprise where one in investigates this, this experience, which is to speak without seeing. Right? Um, if, if seeing entails the light, this is to enter, enter speech in a kind of strange space which is neither light nor dark, neither night nor day. And so, I'm, what I'm trying to do is move you away from the image of the night, because, and also to a certain extent away from the image of dying, because it's very easy to, to translate this into a very morose kind of um, meditation on, on uh, you know, a lapse from consciousness. And it is about a lapse, a falling away from consciousness, a, a, a distance from consciousness, a distance from the self. But that movement, um, I think, is, is, is too easily arrested if we stay within this metaphorics of day, night, um, death, uh, life, and so forth. And he's, 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 he's rendering through this play, and that's why I, I called your attention to the, this tropologic movement, he's, through this play he's trying to call our attention to a more fundamental ambiguity. And, uh, and so the, to, to write in his sense of the literary experimentation is to move into this other space, um, or to explore this ambiguity in, is in it, language. Is it more like in... Nietzsche is it more Dionysian in that way? Or you could say it's more Dionysian. He, he does talk about uh, passion. Well, we had that with Saad. You know, in a certain sense, this other space is already present in the in the act of negation, in the Saadi of negation, because it's a, you know there's something utterly excessive about it. It's, some, it's gone it's gone out of control in some in some sense, right? It's not a it's not the negative of, of measure of reason and so forth. It's an irrational negativity. And so the, the other side is already present in Saad. Um, even though he incarnates something of the negative that gives us reason and logic and so forth. So, um, yeah, there is a, there is a, um, yeah, there's always this excess. But he's, it does seem like he's resisting a kind of like, um, like Levinas resists a certain kind of light, a, a kind of light that, you know, if, if we're dealing with that kind of light, we're also dealing with a kind of mastery. Or yes, like and he's resisting the light of representation. Yeah. He's resisting the line of representation, uh, where the thing is represented for the subject, and, um, and, and, the, and that movement becomes a movement of absolute self-reflection, whereby the spirit realizes a totality of meaning and uh, completes the day, as we were seeing yesterday. So there is this. In the, the writer is trying to bring forth this otherness in language through its materiality and actually succeeds, he suggests, to some extent. Something is starting to happen in when language is reduced in this manner. So he says, yeah, it's like an inexorable affirmation. Death is the impossibility of dying. So he continues, by turning itself into an inability to reveal anything, literature is attempting to become the revelation of what revelation destroys. This is a tragic endeavor, unfortunately. Literature says, I no longer represent, I am. I do not signify, I present. But this wish to be a thing, this refusal to mean anything, um, is utterly, I'm going to just try to skip forward a bit, it, it is subverted. Because no matter how hard literature tries to become a thing, to shed itself of meaning, to undo its signifying character, it nevertheless continues to appear as language, trying to shed itself of meaning. So what, um, th there is a kind of irreducible reflection going on in, in, in language. Language is always presenting itself as language. There, there is this, um, there's this irreducible presence of language as such, which language cannot shed, no matter how hard it tries. So we have in the end of the next paragraph, it were to be, if it were to become as mute as a stone, as passive as the corpse enclosed behind that stone, its decision to lose the capacity for speech would still be legible on the stone, and it would be enough to wake that bogus corpse. There's a lot of images of, of, of bogus corpses in, in the show, particularly in Thomas the Obscure. So, literature cannot um, escape itself in this movement. It cannot escape this something, a kind of reflective dimension in language. But, he says, this is, there's still something else has happened here. 
Um, so it is a tragic endeavor. Literature cannot escape itself. But nevertheless, something has been revealed. And so he, he says that in the next paragraph. When literature refuses to name anything, when it turns a name into something obscure and meaningless, witness the, to the primordial obscurity, what has disappeared in this case, the meaning of the name, is really destroyed. But signification in general has appeared in its place. Signification in general. Meaning without determination. A meaning without delimitation or definition. It's a kind of wandering meaning. Meaning without uh, order, so to speak. The meaning, uh, signification in general has, has appeared in its place. The meaning of the meaninglessness embedded in the word as expression of the obscurity of existence. So in a certain sense, it has been successful. The obscurity is being signified, but it's being signified, signified through the presence of signification in general, through this odd presence of language as language. So that although it's pre the precise meaning of the terms has faded, what asserts itself now is the very possibility of signifying, the empty power of bestowing meaning, a strange impersonal life. Here's the other night again, as a strange impersonal life. So there is this, um, the, the tragic endeavor, in fact, entails a, a form of success. This comes back, uh, I'm going to con conclude this discussion with a brief, um, again, reading a few lines for you. Page 330. Planchot now starts rehearsing the entire movement he's gone through. And he'll do this quite a bit through the pages that follow. So it, it is, um, it's a long and, and in that way challenging essay as he works through this, what he calls these two slopes of literature. L literature, on the one hand, wants to realize the negative within it. That's the movement toward nothing, the Himalayan um, endeavor. Um, but at the same time, literature follows the other slope, which is this passage toward poetry, toward this physicality of language and into this uh, meaninglessness. And what he wants to suggest is ultimately these two cannot be separate from one another. And the, the real character of literature inheres in this oscillation or ambiguity whereby the one appears the, as the other constantly. So I'm going to skip over his re rehearsing of the negative um, and just go to this other slope of literature, page 330. There is another side to literature. Literature is a concern for the reality of things, for their unknown, free, and silent existence. Literature is their innocence and their forbidden presence. It is the being which protests against revelation. It is the defiance of what does not want to take place outside. In this way, it sympathizes with darkness, is what you were asking about, with aimless passion, with lawless violence, with everything in the world that seems to perpetuate the refusal to come into the world. So this is sad, but it's also l'autrement uh, in, in the uh, late 19th century in France. Also bataille, to a certain extent. Right? In this way, too, it allies itself with the reality of language. It makes language into matter without contour, content without form, a force that is capricious and impersonal, it says nothing, reveals nothing, it simply announces, through its refusal to say anything, that it comes from night and will return to night. In itself, this metamorphosis is not unsuccessful. It is certainly true that words are transformed. They no longer signify shadow, earth, which would be signifiers which mean, which point to earth or which you know, signify this, 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 this meaning. They no longer signify shadow earth. They no longer represent the absence of shadow and earth, which is meaning, which is the shadow's light, which is the transparency of the earth. Opacity is their answer. Now, this is perhaps my favorite phrase in this. Opacity is their answer. The flutter of closing wings is their speech. The flutter of closing wings is their speech. In them, physical weight is present as the stifling density of the accumulation of syllables that has lost all meaning. The metamorphosis has taken place. But behind the change that has solidified, petrified, and stupefied words, two things reappear in this metamorphosis. The meaning of this metamorphosis, the language showing itself as language becoming thing, and the meaning the words contain by virtue of their apparition as things, or, if it should happen this way, as vague, indeterminate, elusive existences in which nothing appears, the heart of death without appearance. So, it is language appearing as language, as a meaningless language, language becoming thing, and in the same way, it is the appearance of the thing itself in its obscurity, and the appearance of the obscurity of the thing in this becoming of it. Literature has certainly triumphed over the meaning of words, but what it has found in words considered apart from their meaning is meaning that has become thing. Meaning become thing. 
no longer the, uh, the product of spirit in its movement, but a strange otherness that attends spirit's activity. It's something that escapes my self-consciousness, something that escapes my hold. Thus it is meaning detached from conditions, separated from its moments, wandering like an empty power, a power that no one can do anything with, a power without power, the simple inability to cease to be, but which because of that appears to be the proper determination of indeterminate and meaningless existence. Again, the simple inability to cease to be, the dying that can't die, the, the death that, is, that does not negate itself in such a way as to subsume itself in, this, in the movement of spirit, and by virtue of that inability to die, that passivity, is there as a kind of ongoing affirmation right, or, or presence. So there's this, again, this other, other form of affirmation. Okay, we could go on and on, and, and we could go through this, those passages much more carefully, and I think that, um, you know, this, is, this text repays um, constant reading. But we have, I think, um, a very powerful um, a very powerful an invitation to understand in the, in the peculiar character of literary language, which he's going to develop in all sorts of ways in his work, you know, going toward a notion of fragmentation and uh, interruption and the neutral and so on and so forth. But he's trying to say that in this sort of this otherness attending language, or this, uh, this way in which it opens on to the other night, or onto this other space, um, language is, is pointing to something beyond itself. And, and I think that one of the difficulties, as I said, with you know, a de deconstructive reading of this text will celebrate ambiguity. But um, Blanchot, I think he's, he's seeing in this something like a, what, what Foucault might have called a passage to the outside. There is a there is a a slippage, a movement, um, and and that is what he will begin to think as he goes forward, as a relation to the neutral. In this text, um, he cites uh, the, a, a, a notion that he developed pretty much with Levinas, which is the notion of the ilia. As as uh, literature moves down this other slope, it it indicates what it, what Levinas tried to meditate on it as this. A kind of almost like a subterranean presence, which, 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 something which one can never quite um, free oneself from, uh, from in existence. And for Levinas, this is something that one wants to free oneself from, right? It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, I'm sorry. What did you say it was called? The ilia, ilia, which in French is there is the ilia. Yeah, yeah. And you'll see on page three thirty-two, there's actually a reference to this notion. In his book, Existence and Existence, Emmanuel Levinas uses the term ilia, there is, to throw some light on this anonymous and impersonal flow of being that precedes all being, being that is already present in the heart of disappearance, that in the depths of annihilation will return to being, being as the fatality of being, nothingness as the existence when there is nothing. Ilia, being. So he gives a reference. If you go to that reference, uh, and the discussion of Ilya, you'll see a citation of Blanchot, which is a, 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 a somewhat typical play of Blanchot in this part. So he cites Levinas to cite himself on this topic of Ilya. So there's this, there's this presence, an anonymous presence, haunting existence, which is not the presence of a subject, but what draws the subject beyond itself or outside itself. And and what, what, we're, what I'm trying to point to with this notion of the ambiguity in language is there is this, again, this signaling of a passage that, that Blanchot is trying to think, this passage outside. And that passage outside will become the relation to the, to the neutral. Yeah? That anonymous presence is, is, is not precisely what has the inability to cease to be. Yes. And that is itself what is affirming the yes. slight absence of the subject. Yes. Well, that's part of the affirmation that I was talking about yesterday. That's the passivity that, that, that we were looking at yesterday. And this, this thing that I'm trying to get at, this turn that the narrator makes in the, uh, the madness of the day, this is, 
still to be effective here. We're, not, we're, we're still on the movement back, so to speak, the movement out, right? the passage to the outside, the slippage of the self into this relation to the neutral. And that, what's what I, what, that's what, I mean, this is, you know, most readings of Blanchot and literary criticism, they, they sort of follow this movement toward the idiot. And what I'm trying to do is make another turn that is implicit in, in his thinking, which is from this encounter with the idiot, or in this relation to the neutral, which he says is without relation, because if we turn it into a relation, we have in some sense grasped it. But in this, in this slippage, in this passage, there is the possibility of another turn. And that's what I'm trying to get at. So, in, in a way, what I was trying to talk about so insistently yesterday, we're, we're not there. We're, we're only in the movement. We're in the movement that the narrator experienced when, um, when Blanchot cited in this text, um, and he cited in that text implicitly, whoever sees God dies. And this is, this is the, the slippage into passivity, into an untruth. And, and the, um, the, the term which occurs at the beginning of that text is, has still not been made. I had another yeah. question of proximity also about the relationship between Blanchot and Lacan. I, mean, I know that's mm. a complex. That's an argument. Happenings in a lot of different places, but the question of the imaginary realm. And the reason why I asked that question is uh, my understanding is that towards the end of his life, Lacan is interpreted by a lot of analysts as disavowing kind of the Baronian non topology saying that the RSI is nothing but a metaphor. And the thing about that in relation to Lacan's affiliation with Joyce, we're thinking that Finnegan's Wake, I mean, it's kind of is, for me, this project is showing that a metaphor always exists in the imaginal realm, that Finnegan's Wake is showing that all of metaphor always is slipping away from itself. Can you... Ah, uh, sorry. I was asking a question about the imaginary realm in Blaine Show's project and wondering a little more about Blaine Show's relationship to Lacan. Uh, in uh, in my and I, I don't I'd like to hear from like maybe a Lacanian uh, about this <laughs> disavowal Lacanian. Um, but about the relationship between RSI and Glenn Show and Joyce, I think there's a. Um, I don't know what you want to kind of ask, but this double moment of double deaths, is it like the separation and the alienation in Latin? Um, the separation is when you uh, go out of psychosis. Anyway, I don't know which one to talk about. Um. Let's be a little careful, uh, um, you know, taking up this issue of luck. I like your question very much, though. Uh, um, did, does somebody want to try to answer? Were you appointed on a hand off as the Lacanian? I don't know why I'm jumping away. I don't know if I understand the question how the RSI works in Lacan or how. My understanding was that it, it was a, you know, just a, the, towards the end of his life, after maybe the last seminar is when he uh, thematizes the Baronian topology. There's a moment at which a lot of traditional analysts kind of revoke Lacan for, and, and critics of Lacan like, uh, dismiss him based on the notion that he, he says, you know, well, in the end, this knot was really nothing but a metaphor. My, this whole topology is nothing but a metaphor, as if to say I, I kind of failed my project. Um, but I think that within Lacanian, what I understand of, which is very little, Lacan's project, but to say that it was nothing but a metaphor would mean that it can exist only in the imaginary, only in the imaginary as Lacan would have structured it. Uh, and I, and, I, and I hear something about, I hear just something with language that in Blanche's use of the imaginary realm. And it, it makes me just a little more curious about that relationship. But I'm sorry to take up so much air. Do you want to respond to that? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, the main thoughts that I have around it is that at, at the beginning, at the year of the concept, I understand it makes more towards the symbolic. And if you see Lacan at the end of his uh, career, it's more towards the real. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I, and I do 
we did, uh, there, there's, um, there was a seminar that we, we can never complete that we was going to call 456. Uh, basically trying to relate to the uh, one, two, three, or the real imaginary symbolic. Mm -hmm. But that's something that he could, that he could never finish. Mm -hmm. in that sense. I am not very uh, aware if RXI was just a metaphor and, and that was it. But I, what I do know is that at the end of the Hans career, he was still very much in, in, in favor of their RXI, especially giving more yeah. dominance to the real. Yeah. And the four, five, six, according to him, would be the the ego, the symptom, and the I can't remember the sixth one, which was basically um, aggregations uh, uh, added value uh, to the RSI in order to function properly. But mm -hmm. um, it's ego, symptom, and I get. Um, I'll come up with it with the sixth one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, in relation to the imaginary, you know, the actual relation between Lacan and Blanchot is, is really kind of shrouded in obscurity. <coughs> Lacan referred to Blanchot a great deal. Um, Blanchot wrote about Lacan. I can only think of two essays when this is coming up, and I can't even remember the names of them. There's one on psychoanalysis of Freud in the infinite conversation where Lacan's name comes up. But there is a very great discretion. And my, I don't think there is anything, um, so to speak, condemning in this discretion. On, on the contrary, I suspect that there is some very great caution. And I have been wondering, is it possible that Lacan was, or that Blanchot was in analysis with Lacan during this period? Uh, during this period, that would be in, let's say, in the 50s and 60s somewhere. And I have absolutely no hint of that. Um, but, you know, one of the questions you would have to ask is, who else would he have been in analysis with at this time? Um, this, is, this takes us into the really very difficult space of uh, Blanchot's struggles. I mean, there are moments that in, in the Le Pau de Lune, in Step Not Beyond, where he says, you know, we, he more or less says, we can deal with madness when it, when, it, when it threatens the first time. What happens if it threatens again? And, and there's, a, there's something very raw about this statement, which suggests that um, you know, Blanchot was struggling through this, this period. I, I think, I, I, I believe the late 40s, early 50s must have been a you know, time of great difficulty for him. Um, and I would guess that if you're in a relationship, uh, if you're, if you're a, a, an Alizan, you, you'll be very loath to, uh, um, to drag your analyst into, I'd say drag him, but you know, in the sense, and if Blanchot wrote about someone, he was bringing them into his space of thinking, and, and uh, not not, with, not in a necessarily reductive way, but nevertheless, there is there is a bit of that capture going on, and, and uh, for some reason he didn't do it to let go. Um, so, what does that mean? I uh, I don't know. Um, now, on the imaginary, the he he is there's a text called Two Versions of the Imaginary. Which is, um, which is very interesting. And, and in that text, he says that when we talk about the image um, in relation to language, we, we, we don't want to, and poetic language as being full of images, what we really have to avoid is the sense that thinking about images as products of language, when he says what we have to begin to think in poetry is the way in which poetry turns language itself into an image of itself. And we've just followed that movement in um, Literature and the Right to Death, whereby language becomes, language appears as language, and in that movement starts to slip from its, uh, you know, from the, from the realm of meaning and the symbolic into, into, uh, into an evocation of another space. That is, language itself is ev evoking another space as it becomes imaginary. And to, to read this, or to experience this, is to enter that space of the imaginary. So, Blanchot, um, I'm coming back to your question about reading. <clears throat> that is to enter a space that he calls fascination um, in, in, uh, on the reader's part. Fascination and a space where, uh, as he said, this is a space of, of um, a so dark space, there's dark quotation marks because I'm trying to be careful with these metaphors, but you know, a space of passions, a space of, a space of um, uh, where the self is not in command, and, um, and so a space of desire. So desire, uh, imagination in the sense of a fancy, but in a very strong sense, and capture 
And in that capture, that fascination, we have something perhaps closest to uh, what Lacan is calling the imaginary in those earlier years when he distinguishes the symbolic, the imaginary, and the real. So you could say that uh, Lachaud was bringing forth that, that, that dimension of the imaginary, um, but ex perhaps extending it um, much more than, than Lacan does. And, and, and in that way, opening on to the real. And I don't know how to, to what extent Lacan does that. I don't know. I leave that to the, the specialist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when he talks about the dedication, um, is there a difference between um, sort of signifying a concrete thing, like, like the ground as a physical um, object, and as a metaphor, like the ground for doing something as a reason? Is there, in, in Bradshaw, is there a difference? Regarding the depth of the root to the thing, the essence of thing, and essence of the metaphor. Well, this is certainly this movement that he's describing when language takes this other, the second slope. This is very much undoing foundations or grounds, and so that to the extent that um, what would well, what would ground is is the the reflective movement of spirit or consciousness itself, that would be the, the ground of truth in, in, the, in, in, in that Hegelian uh, uh, dialectic which he's playing with in this text. Uh, but you're asking about ground in the sense of kind of earth, is that what you mean? And, um, and Heidegger, I mean, with Blanchot here is, is um, you know, he's suggesting it, that, that the, this use of language suspends any kind of signification or, or, in, or the order of meaning that would unfold through the, the, the use of language to signify um, some ideal meaning. And um, so in undoing that signifying, it would be um, undoing, undoing any, any, any ground and including the representation of a ground as a ground. It's so it's the same for metaphors and, and this direct signification? It's a kind of, <coughs> it's a kind of generalization of that in the sense that if you generalize metaphor, there's a beautiful text of Derrida called uh, Le Retrait de la Metaphor, the, the Retreat of Metaphor. And he suggests that if you, um, if you generalize metaphor, um, then you, dis you dissolve the relation between the proper and the improper. So there can no longer be metaphor in, in a, if, if everything becomes metaphorical. And, um, and what we have is, a, is kind of a generalized figurality. And, and then the question is, well, how can there be meaning in such a... Um, such a movement. But this is something like that dissolution of meaning in a generalization of the imaginary or generalization of the figural character of language. But here, language itself is, is a figure of itself and thereby opening onto the space of passivity and this, what he describes, the, the power of signification in general, which is without, without limitation, without definition, without determination, without any of the moments in the dialectical movement, you know, and hence without, it's not pinned down in any sense at all. Right. I was wondering, yeah. um, the, one of the points that you ended on the other day, it's kind of how like this whole thing represents this sort of relationality without relation, another politics piece. I think it's really interesting, and, like, um, there's definitely something that's like, extremely worthwhile in terms of how we think about ourselves in relation to others and all of that, but... Um, and as a writer, but then my question is, because um, you also ended then by saying, you know, first you have to undo what you have before you can you can't offer a figure. But my question is still like, w at what point do you get to ever offer a figure, or is it just at the right the point of um, the, the role of the uh, writer or whatever is to inhabit this neutral space, and that, so it's never really theirs. Um, well, it's no, I think this is a very good word. question, and this is. Um, uh, I want to keep going on this movement I'm trying to describe because we're 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 in the first step that you right. Right, evoked. Right? Yeah. I, I, this is a, a slipping from the order of meaning of figuration in the way you've just described, or positing. Right? In, in in the political sphere, um, we have to posit some um, d you know determination of meaning. Some you know we have we have to describe what is in 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 terms that um, situate. Uh, what has to be done, or, or what is unjust, you know, we have to describe what is, and we have to attempt to try to think of the process by which um, this, there can be change and there can be um, transformation. All of this requires what you're calling 
figuring, right? Or, or some sort of, uh, all of it requires a positive, uh, uh, you know, a determination. Uh, it, it requires um, statements you know, and propositions and, you know, the, the, all, all of that. And Blanchot is, um, well, Blanchot accepts that dialectic is probably the way in which this, has, this movement has to be thought. Uh, he says at least that dialectic is the horizon of our time. He, he says this in a text from um, 1960, which was, he proposed for um, a literary project called the International Journal. And this is a really interesting project because he tried to bring, he tried to make it a, he tried to make it a, a, a global reach, but in fact it's European. <laughs> And, um, and I, I say that with a little bit of humor because it's, it's just odd that he, he, he kind of fails to recognize the Eurocentrism in, in his gesture, even though he's so open to, to alterity. But um, it failed uh, because the, the, the different uh, parties, he had some very, very big uh, literary people involved in uh, Italians, um, French, Germans, um, I think the Danish. There are a couple Americans involved. Um, but the um, I, I'm trying to get to this. this what I said, this, uh, a, a statement that he makes there regarding um, um, oh, regarding dialectic. He says um, we will accept in this project the necessity of a dialectical analysis of our situation today, because, he says, dialectical materialism is the, is the intellectual horizon of our time. So, in a certain sense, we start from there, but, he says at the same time, we have to bring into play what literature offers of, of another relation. And, and there, there is precisely the double imperative that I was talking about a couple of nights ago. We, we acknowledge the importance of dialectical materialism for trying to think the current situation and trying to think um, a path towards some justice, and ultimately that's a path toward the communism that he evokes. But at the same time, we want to try to understand what literature brings of another relation to ourselves, to others, and, and to the world. And the, 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 the issue then is how we can think about this literary relation informing this act of trying to be faithful to the exigency of justice when it comes to um, dealing with oppression, with, with you know, unacceptable situations, and however these are described. He has a beautiful uh, text on Berlin um, in, in, that, in that series of notes for this international journal in which he talks about the, the utterly un, in a, unacceptable character of that division, what it means in, in, in Europe. So, um, but the, so the question then, you know, that that has to be, and we, see, we, have, we haven't even begun, we haven't at all made this turn that I'm talking about, because what I've described here is, a, is uh, what he describes here, what I'm following here, is, is a kind of, he's following, he's entering into a kind of passivity that um, literary language uh, offers um, via this, this, this play of the imaginary, by, via to some degree of fascination. But this, this move, he's, 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 he's following this, this, this passage that I've tried to describe. You know, he's not, he's not just dwelling in ambiguity, which would be a kind of high-class nihilism. Rather, he sees in that ambiguity of literary language a movement back from the, um, well, let's just say the, 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 the command and the whole of the subject as instituted in, in dialectic. So it is a it is a movement away from subjectivity, from representation, in, in, in the sense of that, um, in in the political order, and so far as it requires propositions and statements and analyses, it, it requires a representation of what is. But that kind of structure of structuring for a subject uh, who is struggling, an object, which is the world that has to be transformed, of course that reproduces the, you know, the problem of subjectivity, and so he's struggling against representation. Can there be a relation to the world which is no longer a representational relation? Which, which, um, because representation requires this negation he's been talking about. Uh, representation requires this loss that, that he is, he's, he's tracking. And, and so the question, you know, which he's trying to raise, and which he raised very radically in this political text is, can we have a political relation which is no longer a, re a relation of representation?
Can we, can we proceed in a community which is no longer a community that forms itself through identification and through structures of recognition and through representation? So we have just now, with this text, we have followed the first passage um, back from, from the hold of subjectivity in, in, in the dialectical sense. And, and the turn, as I said, the turn that which I was trying to point to in the Madness and the Zeta, it hasn't, hasn't appeared yet. Um, and in a sense, what we, what we don't yet, yet have in this text is the motif of interruption. Um, it's, it's, it's in some respects um, startlingly absent when I think about it. I mean, if you think, you know, the madness of the day is 1949. I mean, he's, he's thinking in terms of interruption. Um, but this text it goes along the, the, those sort of smooth wheels, uh, on the smooth wheels of dialectical you know, reasoning. You know, it's, it's, it sort of subverts the dialectic and then moves into this other space, but you know, with this extraordinarily, uh, um, it's still in this high language, you know, or the use of language, and it's playful, it's, uh, but nevertheless, the imperative of fragmentation, interruption, uh, uh, which, which he talks about elsewhere, is, n is not there yet. Um, now, I, I was puzzling, I, I always walk off a little bit trying to collect my thoughts, and uh, as I was walking out, I think to myself, how could I say it's not there? Surely it's there, but it, in some sense, it's, he hasn't engaged this notion of interruption um, thematically in, in this text. So, where does it come? Well, it comes in fact, um, <clears throat> whenever Blanchot starts talking about the relation to another human being, 